so hi everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming today and uh, thank you especially to uh, University of Michigan for bringing me down to talk to you today. Uh, starting with the Pluto thing is never a good way to introduce myself to people, so <laughs> <coughs> don't blame me, please. Uh, <coughs> so as, uh, as you mentioned, I am a professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Alaska. And uh, what I'm here to do today is to talk to you about something that I do that actually is not directly related to my research, but is something that I've been doing for many years. And that is taking data from the research class telescopes, not only at Kid Peak, but at other professional observatories, and creating color composite images with the data from those telescopes. So you may not know me by name, but hopefully you've seen uh, some of my images over the years. Uh, this image in particular has uh, gotten some attention recently uh, because it's been used by uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and his reboot of Cosmos, though they turned it into an eyeball, which was a little bit creepy uh, <laughs> for me, but uh, I was still honored that they, uh, that they used it. So uh, the way I started getting started in this work is after I finished my PhD at the University of Colorado in 1998, I was a postdoc at Kid Peak National Observatory uh, near Tucson, Arizona, and this is a picture of the summit of Kid Peak. And at the time that I had arrived at Kitt Peak, they had just commissioned a new wide field imaging camera called Mosaic. And this is a picture of the Mosaic camera uh, on one of the telescopes at Kitt Peak. Mosaic uh, is a 64 megapixel camera. It's 8,000 by 8,000 pixels on a side, uh, which even by today's standards is pretty big. Uh, but back in 1998, it was ludicrously big. It was a, a very... Uh, challenging instrument to use. Uh, in 1998, does anyone remember what digital cameras were like back in 1998? Does anyone have a digital camera from 1998? You may, most people didn't even know they existed back in 1998. And so processing the data off of this, this camera uh, proved to be a real challenge. And so <clears throat> one of the things we wanted to do is to show off the capabilities of this camera, not only to other astronomers, but also to the public. And so I was given the task of creating images that could show off what this, this telescope can do, uh, this telescope and camera can do. And this camera is touted for its wide field imaging capability. Now, wide field in astronomy is different than wide field means for a normal camera. So this camera, uh, when mounted on the 0.9 meter telescope, the base of which is shown in this picture, has a one square degree field of view, which uh, is basically the size of your thumbnail held out at arm's length. And so if you <coughs> just take a second to do that, that doesn't look very big, does it? Well, for astronomy purposes, it's huge. Uh, <coughs> and so the first image I ever created with this camera is this one right here. And what it was intended to do uh, was to show off the field of view of the camera compared to the size of the moon. And you can see that the moon only has about half the diameter of the field of view of this camera. So this camera uh, has the ability to see an area that's larger <coughs> excuse me, than the area of the moon. Now here is another image that I created using the same camera and telescope. And this is of an object called the Rosette Nebula. And you can see the Rosette is actually bigger than the moon, at least as it appears uh, to your eye. So. <coughs> So I started making these images for Kid Peak, and uh, the images came out well, and they asked me to do some more. And uh, just a warning for you uh, young people in the audience, you do something once, it's a favor, you do it twice, it's your job. <coughs> so keep that in mind. So while I was at Kid Peak, I continued to make these images, and even after I left Kid Peak and went to other observatories, uh, I started, I continued to make these images. And so ever since I've been making images, and I also make images, uh, for the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile, and I also make images uh, with the Gemini telescopes in Hawaii and Chile. And yes, that does mean I have to travel to Hawaii and Chile for my work. <coughs> so for over the last 20 years, I've been making these images, and, and in that time span, I've made uh, almost 250 images for one reason or another. And in that time, I've been asked a lot of questions about the images and how they're made and why we do them. And so that's what I wanted to talk with you about today. <clears throat> so the first thing I want to talk about is why do we make these images? Something that's important for people to know is, is that when they see these images, they often think the images are the science. That is, that this image that you see is what pops off the telescope. And then that's what the scientist looks at and says, aha, the answer is X. And they write it down and they publish a paper and get a Nobel Prize and we're done. Uh, but the images themselves are usually used primarily 
as a visualization tool. That is, we take the data from the telescope and we create these images to help us visualize the science that we're trying to do. The actual science itself is almost always done with the data, not the actual image that we create. So we use these images to help us visualize the science that we're doing. And we often make these images also to demonstrate new technologies. So for example, this is an image of what are called the Orion bullets. These are stars that are being shot out of the Orion molecular cloud where new stars are being formed. And as these stars are being shot out of the nebula, they're traveling at supersonic speeds and leaving a wake behind them, very similar to the wake that a boat produces as it's going through the water. And so this image was created uh, with the Gemini North Telescope using a technique called adaptive optics, which is a technology that allows us to correct for most of the blurring caused by the Earth's atmosphere. And this image right here is actually as sharp or sharper than what the Hubble Space Telescope can do, at least at infrared light. So it's a way of demonstrating what we can do. And then finally, we also create these images as a way to share with the public the amazing things that our telescope can see and the science that we're doing with them. Now, in the years that I've been sharing these images with people, there's been a lot of questions about the veracity of these images. And this is a Calvin and a Hobbes cartoon back from the 80s, well before Photoshop even existed. And, and so when I show these sorts of pictures to people, almost all the time, 90% of the time, the first question people ask me is something like this. Is this what it really looks like? Are the colors real? Or even, if I were standing right next to this, is this what I would see? And let's just you know, put aside for a second what does it mean to be standing right next to a galaxy. <laughs> um, but these are, all, these are all good questions to ask. And what these questions are basically asking is, is, is they're thinking, well, when we look at something through a telescope, the telescope is acting like a pair of binoculars and making something that's far away but closer. So it's a reasonable question to ask, well, if I were just closer to this and I didn't need the telescope or binoculars, is this is what I would see. So what I like to use as an illustration to answer these questions is this picture right here. This is an image I made of the iconic Horsehead Nebula in the constellation of Orion. And this is a picture we created using that mosaic camera uh, with the 0.9 meter telescope on Kitt Peak. So from one side to the other, uh, it is uh, one degree across. And so this is a picture we created using the telescope. Now this nebula is about a thousand light years away. So let's imagine you get in a spaceship and you were to fly that distance out to the nebula. Somehow you survived the journey. And when you get out there, you look through the porthole on your, on your spacecraft, what would you see? Uh, this is basically what you would see. So this is something that people are often surprised to learn. And that is, is that even though you're much closer to the nebula, you still can't see it. And this has to do with something called surface brightness. Surface brightness is the ratio of how much light is coming from an object to how big the object appears, the, ang the, the uh, angular size of it. And as you get closer to an object, you're getting more light from it. That's the inverse square law. But it's also getting bigger. And so that ratio stays the same. And so per unit of angular area, the object doesn't actually get brighter. And this is something you can try at home. Walk towards a wall. As you walk towards the wall, the wall gets bigger, but it doesn't actually get brighter. And so what that means is, is that if you can't see the Orion Nebula from here on Earth, you're not going to be able to see it even if you're much closer. And as I mentioned before, that picture that I showed you is twice the angular diameter of the moon. The moon is definitely large enough for you to see, and so would the Horsehead Nebula if your eyes were able to see it. So when it comes to these sorts of questions, when people ask me these questions, they're essentially asking two questions. So is this what it really looks like? Is basically asking, is this what my eyes would see? Because people assume that the way your eyes work is, a, is an accurate representation of reality. And, and it turns out that's not the case. Uh, so is this what it really looks like? And the answer, no matter what the image is, unless it's an ob a bright object like a planet or moon inside our solar system, the answer is almost always no. And it doesn't matter how the image was created or who created it or what telescope. It's not because of the limitations of the telescope. It's because of the limitations of your eye. So why is the answer always no? Well, one I've already described, and that is the effect of surface brightness. So again, the closer you get to it, the bigger it is, but the brighter uh, it stays the same brightness. Now another issue is, 
is our eyes can't see color in faint light. And that's because we have two types of detectors in our eyes called rods and cones. The cones are what see color, but the cones only work if it's an object is bright enough. The rods see black and white and are what allow us to see faint objects when it's dark out. There's only a handful of stars that are bright enough for you to actually see the color. So for example, Betelgeuse is a star in the constellation of Orion, where you can definitely see that it has a reddish color. But most of the stars you look at in the night sky appear black and white. Another issue is, is that our eyes do not have very good sensitivity to red light. And that's why whenever you go to an observatory, we have all those little red lights around. And that's because even though you, the light gives you enough light to see where you're going, it doesn't affect your dark adaptation, so you're still able to see things in the dark. So one of the kinds of light that many objects produce is a kind of light called hydrogen alpha. It's a specific color of red light produced by warm hydrogen gas. And only about half of people can see this kind of light. But much of the light that comes from the universe is this color of light. And then finally, I'll mention that there's all sorts of kinds of light that our eyes can't see. The light that our eyes can see we often call optical or visible light, but there's other kinds of light as well, such as radio waves and infrared light and x-rays and ultraviolet as well. And these are kinds of light that are also produced by objects in space, but our eyes can't see them. So one of my co-authors on the book uses an analogy that I really like, and that is imagine you have a piano and it has 88 keys on it. And imagine you can only hear one key. That wouldn't be very exciting, would it, right? So you're listening to a beautiful piece by Debussy, and all you hear is just that one key. Well, that's not very exciting. That's basically our eyes. Our eyes see a very narrow portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So there's this whole range of light that we can't see. And so we build telescopes to allow us to see those kinds of light. <clears throat> so when it comes to the types of telescopes that we build and use, there's three major things that we do with our telescopes. The first is the one that everyone thinks of, and that is magnify objects. We take something that looks small and make it look bigger. But we also do other things. In particular, we build telescopes to collect lots of light, to make objects that are faint appear brighter. So not just magnify, but also amplify. And then finally, we use telescopes to expand our vision, to see kinds of light that our eyes can see because listening to just that one note on the piano is pretty boring. So we think of our eyes as being uh, the teller of truth, but in reality our eyes are just an optical instrument, and it turns out they're very good at what they do, but only in the daytime. And that's because our eyes have a very small aperture that allows light through. The pupil, the black area in our eye that allows light through, even when it's fully dilated, fully dark adapted, only opens up to about a quarter of an inch diameter. Now, in comparison, this is the primary meter mirror for the 8-meter Gemini North Telescope. So the mirror goes from one side of the image to the other, and you can see there's a person sitting in the middle. That's a technician who's inspecting the coating on the mirror. And I like this picture because it gives you a sense of scale as to how big it is. So it's 8 meters across from one side to the other, which is basically about from this wall uh, to the end of that bench over there. So what this means is, is this mirror at any given moment is collecting 10,000 times more light than your eyes can. So, this, uh, so telescopes are often called light buckets because they're devices built to be able to collect lots of light. Now another thing to know is, is that our telescopes are designed to do long exposures. Our eye works like a video camera. It's taking exposures about 30 times a second. So each exposure that our eyes take is only collecting light for 1 30th of a second, whereas our telescopes are built to collect light for as long as we like. So this is a time-lapse movie of the Gemini telescope in operation. And you'll see the telescope is moving because the night sky moves and the telescope is designed to follow it. And so using telescopes, we can collect light from an object uh, for many hours to many days depending on the kind of project that we're doing. So the deepest image that's ever been produced uh, is with the Hubble Space Telescope, and it created an image called the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, or the HXDF or XDF. 
The Hubble Extreme Deep Field is not actually the first deep image that Hubble created. They first created the Hubble Deep Field back in the 90s, HDF, and then they did the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And now it's the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, and who knows what's going to come next. Maybe it'll be the Hubble Ludicrous Deep Field, <laughs> or Hubble Absurd Deep Field, or oh my god, you won't believe how deep this deep field is. <laughs> so this picture right here uh, shows the, the square in the middle shows uh, the field of view of the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, and then it has a picture of the moon for comparison there. I showed this picture to someone once, and I said, well, that's dumb. Why would you look at something right next to the moon? The moon is really bright. <laughs> well, the moon is just there for scale. They didn't look at it when the moon uh, was right there. This is actually somewhere in the constellation of the Big Dipper. And this picture right here shows the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. And to create this image, they used Hubble to stare at this location in the sky for a cumulative 50 days to collect light. And so the faintest objects in this picture are about 10 billion times fainter than what your eyes can see. And in this picture, we can see some of the most uh, distant galaxies ever seen. And those are shown uh, in the circles there uh, with the funny numbers next to them. So one of the most important things to know about telescopes is not that they just magnify things. People often assume, oh, the objects we're looking at are too small. That's why we can't see them. But most of the objects you actually see pictures of are not too small. They're too faint. And if you had eyes that were as sensitive as Hubble and as big as Gemini, you would be able to see just an amazing array of nebula across the sky. Now, as amazing as our telescopes are, uh, the instruments that we use to create them, for the most part, are designed to only collect light of a particular wavelength range at a time. And again, for, most, for the most part, our instruments, when they collect light, can't tell what color of light that it is. That is, it only measures the intensity of light that's coming to the camera. And that intensity of light is just, create, is just is recorded, essentially, like a black and white image. So what you're seeing here is a, is a raw image uh, from one of the mosaic telescopes, uh, from, one of the, from the mosaic camera on Kitt Peak. And this is of an object uh, called the Crescent Nebula. Can anyone guess why it's called the Crescent Nebula? Because it looks like a crescent, right? Pretty obvious. So to create a color image, what we do is we take pictures of an object uh, through two or more filters. And so this picture right here shows a part of the filter wheel for the mosaic camera. And you can see three of the filters that we have, red, green, and blue filters. And so the easiest way to create an image is essentially doing the same process that your cell phone does or your digital camera when it takes a picture. And that is to look at it through red, green, and blue filters and then combine that. And then you can create a final color image. So this is what uh, the crescent look, look, looks like after we combine that data. Now here's one of the challenges we face, and that is our eyes have three types of cones in them that see roughly red, green, and blue light. But we use many different kinds of filters uh, on Kitt Peak and other telescopes. And so right here you're seeing in the picture in the upper right where it says the S cones, rods, M, and L cones, it's showing the relative sensitivities of the cones in our eyes. And the S cones, which are designed to see short wavelength light, see primarily blue. The M cones see primarily green. And the L cone for long wavelength seems primarily yellow to red. And what our brain is doing when it creates a color image in our mind is just measuring the relative intensities of those different kinds of light coming into our eyes. So if I stare at this gentleman's red coat, that the reason why I see it as red is because the L cones inside my eye are being, uh, being activated more than the other cones, and that's how my brain figures out it's red. So when we see color, it's because the cones in our eyes are measuring the relative intensities of lights in these three different types of cones. And we can simulate that by using three filters that mimic the wavelength range of our cones. So what you're seeing on the left here is a plot for the Johnson Bessel UBVRI filters. And the B filter, the V filter, and the R filter roughly correspond to the sensitivity range of the S, M, and L cones in our eyes. B is for blue, R is for red, V is for visible, because in astronomy we never do things the easy way. The U stands for ultraviolet, and the I stands for infrared. And these two filters see kinds of light that are just a little bit outside the range of what our eyes can see. 
So when we use these filters to make images, we have to ask ourselves the question, what color do I make a kind of light that my eyes can't see? And that complicates things. Now to make things even more complicated, we use other types of filters called narrowband filters. And narrowband filters are filters that instead of letting a wide range of different colors through, they only let very specific colors of light through. And in, in, in particular, they let specific colors of light that are produced by specific types of atoms. So this picture right here shows the types of light that are seen by the hydrogen beta, shown as the HB, oxygen 3, hydrogen alpha, and sulfur 2 filters. And so what we use these filters for is actually to block out light and only allow those very specific colors of light through. The reason why we do that is because it allows us to see what these particular types of atoms are doing inside the object that we're looking at. Now I'll point out here that hydrogen alpha and sulfur 2 are both colors of red and our eyes can't differentiate between these two colors of red. But by using these narrowband filters, we can tell the difference. And so we can see what the hydrogen atoms are doing and we can see what the sulfur atoms are doing. And scientists use this to learn a whole bunch of things about the objects we're looking at. We can learn about the, what type of object it is, we can learn about the temperature of the object, and do other things as well. So by looking at just these very specific colors of light, we're able to learn a lot of information. So we can create images using these different types of filters, not only the narrow band, but the broad band. And it allows us to create color images that are more interesting to look at. So this picture right here shows, uh, sh these two pictures show what's called Barnard's Galaxy, NGC 6822. It's a nearby dwarf irregular galaxy. And the picture on the left shows what this galaxy looks like if we just use the standard blue, green, and red filters. The image on the right is one we made using eight filters, where we use the blue, green, and red, but we also use the ultraviolet and infrared filters, and we use three narrowband filters to show us what the oxygen, sulfur, and hydrogen is doing inside the galaxy. And the image on the right, you can see, shows more detail. In particular, by using those narrowband filters, we're better able to see the warm hydrogen gas inside this galaxy. So by using more filters, we're able to bring out more information about this object and create an image that's more interesting to look at. So how do we do it? How do we make a color image? Well, what we do is, is we look at the galaxy or nebula or whatever we're looking at. We'll look at it through each of the filters. And through each filter, we'll get a black and white image. So this is a black and white image of a nearby spiral galaxy called the Triangular Galaxy, or M33. And this is what the galaxy looks like through a blue filter. And with the blue filter, we are seeing primarily the light from hot blue stars inside the galaxy. Now this is a picture of the same galaxy, but now this is through the hydrogen alpha filter. And it's showing us the specific color of red light produced by warm hydrogen gas. So you'll notice that these two images look very different. Again, this is the blue, and this is the hydrogen alpha. So an important thing to know is that each filter gives us different pieces of information about the object that we're looking at. So when we create the color image, what we do is we assign a color or colorize each filter. So what we'll do is we'll make the hydrogen alpha filter, for example, red. And then the infrared filter, when I made this image, I chose to make it orange. And so again, a good question to ask is, what color should be a kind of light that your eyes can't see? Well, I chose orange because it is a relatively low energy light, and I wanted it to be a different color than the red, because I'm already using red for hydrogen alpha. I then made the red filter yellow, the V filter, which is the green filter green, the blue filter blue, and then the ultraviolet filter I made violet. And this is what's called chromatic ordering. That is, that as we go to higher energy types of light, we're assigning it a higher energy color. And then when we combine them all together, this is the final color image of the galaxy that we get. <clears throat> and then if we zoom in in the upper left corner, you can see that we can see the, the hot clouds of hydrogen gas where new stars are being formed, and we can see a wide range of star colors. So this is an example of an object where it helps us to look at the object through many filters and create an image uh, that shows us more detail. But sometimes we want to go the opposite direction, and that is we create images 
just using the narrowband filters. So here's that horsehead nebula image I showed you earlier. And this is an image I created using only narrowband filters. And I did that because by using just the narrowband filters, we can block out scattered light produced by dust grains inside the nebula. And when we block out that light, it allows us to see what the gas is doing better. And you'll notice that if you look just to the right of the nebula, you'll see these vertical stripes in the gas, these striations. And that shows us how the hydrogen atoms are moving in the magnetic field inside this nebula. So sometimes it helps to add more information, to add more filters and give us more light. Sometimes it helps to take it away. So when we create these images, <coughs> we often think about how people are going to interpret the images. And this is something that's called visual grammar. And visual grammar is something that artists have known uh, for hundreds of years. And what it is, is it's how we read an image. That is, how our brains look at an image and interpret what's going on inside of it. Now, if you look at this picture here, I'm going to ask you a very simple question that's easy to answer, but not so easy to answer why. Which half of this image is further away? The top half or the bottom half? What would you say? It's the top half. That's the easy part. Why is the top half further away? How do you know that? OK, so it looks fuzzy. OK. We see scattered light. OK, so you know, I know I'm at a physics talk when I hear things like scattered light, right? Okay. <laughs> OK, so the scattered light, what's producing that scattered light? Air. Air, right? So the atmosphere. So the atmosphere is causing uh, the sky to be blue. And that's actually a natural visual cue that we use, that we can interpret that things that are bluer are further away because we naturally intuit that scattered light from the gas between us and that object is making it look bluer. Now, when the uh, Apollo astronauts went to the moon, they actually had a hard time figuring out where they were because when they looked at something off in the distance, they couldn't tell if it was a small hill that was nearby or a large mountain off in the distance. There was no atmosphere, so they lacked that visual cue to help them figure out where they were. Now, there's another visual cue that's going on here, and I heard some people mentioning this, and that is that when we look at this scene, we're, of course, seeing trees that we're familiar with, and we know that trees come in a range of sizes, but there's actually sort of a modest range, right? You might have really big trees and really small trees, but trees are not this big and then this small, right? They come in a, in a reasonable range, and our brains naturally interpret similar looking objects as having the same intrinsic size, and so the smaller it appears, the further it must be. And so when we look at this picture, we can see trees off in the distance on the hillside, and they look smaller, so we know that they must be further away. Now, when we look at images of space, even if we're not intending to, we use these same visual cues to help us interpret what we're seeing. So when we look at this image here of a part of what's called the Lagoon Nebula, which part looks further away to you? The blue part, right? We're our brains naturally interpret that as being the case. Now, in this nebula, we also have some other visual references that help us figure that out. So for example, in the bottom half, you'll see that there's a dark nebula on the right side. And notice that the edge of that dark nebula overlaps this little finger looking thing on the in the lower left corner. And that's a visual cue that our brains use to help us know that, that, object, that the part on the right is closer than the part on the left. But we also use the blue as a way to reference that as well. But if you take a moment, you can actually convince your brains that the blue part is closer, if you just take a second to do that. So sometimes people ask me, how does Hubble see 3D? And the reason why they're asking that is because they look at these pictures and they look three-dimensional. It has nothing at all to do with Hubble's doing, and, that, and, and this is true of all telescopes. It's how color is being used in these images. So just to do a simple side-by-side -side comparison, here is an image of what's called the Keyhole Nebula, on the left in color, and then on the right in black and white. And you can see that the color image just looks much more dynamic. It's just really popping out at you much more easily. And so it's just a good way of showing how we use, how color, our brains naturally interpret color to learn information. Now another way in which our brains learn color 
uh, use color is uh, to estimate the temperature of an object. Because for most people, and that's probably not the people in the audience here I recognize, uh, we see red as being hot and blue as being cold because flames are red and ice is blue. And as many of you probably know, uh, in reality, it's just the opposite. Objects that are heated internally uh, are blue if they're hot and red if they're cooler, like stars. But we often interpret blue as being colder and red as being warmer. So when we make images of objects, we think about what is the science story that we're trying to convey and how can we use color to help naturally convey that story. So what you're seeing right here is a picture again of the triangular galaxy M33. The picture on the left shows what it looks like using just one of the telescopes on Kitt Peak. And the image on the right shows the same galaxy, but now we've added radio data from the Very Large Array Telescope in New Mexico. After I was at Kitt Peak, I went to uh, the Very Large Array to be a postdoc there. And th I started making images for them, and it raised all these questions of, well, how do you make color images of radio waves. You can't see radio waves, so what does that mean? Well, what you're seeing in this picture here is a specific wavelength of radio waves produced by cold hydrogen gas inside the galaxy. And so the color, the color we chose uh, was based upon the science we wanted to convey. So if we zoom in here, you'll notice at the center of this image there is a reddish nebula where stars are being formed. And the reason why the nebula is red is because the hot stars that just formed in that nebula are heating up the gas and causing it to glow, uh, producing that hydrogen alpha light that I've told you about. Now, outside of that nebula, there is cold hydrogen gas that has not been yet heated by stars nearby. And so that is what the Very Large Array Telescope sees. And we chose to make that violet because violet is a mix of red and blue. So the red inside the violet causes it to blend naturally with the red inside the nebula at the center. But since it has blue added to it, it naturally conveys that that gas is colder than the red inside the nebula. Now if I had chosen a color like green and used green for it, the green would have just completely overlaid that red part and they would not look connected. And physically, that would be, that's not true. The gas is connected, so we wanted to choose a color so the gas uh, seen by the optical telescope blends with the gas seen by the radio telescope. Now, I'm probably completely overthinking this, but we are hoping that by using color in this way, someone can look at this image and just naturally intuit that the violet gas they're seeing is colder than the red gas that they're seeing. Now, when I make these images, uh, people often ask me, well, do you see this as being art, and how do you see that as being different as science? And we often are led to think that science and art are competing things, that you can't have one and have the other. And I don't agree with that. You can have something that is scientifically accurate and scientifically interesting, and also have it be artistically interesting. That is, it can be scientific and beautiful. So this is an example of an object where we actually made some scientific discoveries uh, by accident. We made this image as a way of showing off what one of the telescopes can do. And in the process, we learned some science. So this is an object called the Iris Nebula. It is a star-forming region. And it looks blue because the dust inside this nebula is scattering light in the same way the dust in our atmosphere does. But if you zoom in to the upper right corner, you'll notice that there are these little red blobs in it. And these red blobs show us, uh, are being produced by stars that are forming inside this nebula. And if I make this image black and white and change the contrast, you can see these, little bit, these blobs a little bit better. And so we knew these objects uh, were called herbic hair objects. And what they are is outflows from stars that are forming inside this cloud of gas. And so if you look at it with the Spitzer Space Telescope, this is what you see. You can, the, the Spitzer Space Telescope is an infrared telescope. And infrared light goes through dust relatively easy. And so if we look inside this cloud of dust and gas, we can see that there are stars forming inside here. And these stars are producing those nebulosities. So we actually got a science paper out of this. And it's just a nice illustration of how we can use these images uh, to actually do science as well. 
So you can have something that's scientifically interesting and attractive to look at. So I've been making these images for years, and I have a gallery of many of the images that I've made. And unfortunately, because the University of Alaska is uh, behind the times in creating websites, it has a terrible name. So it's easier to find it if you just Google my name. Uh, but on this website, uh, there are, I have most of the images I've made uh, using these different telescopes. I also have galleries of uh, just plain old camera pictures, most of which are pictures from the different observatories that I've gotten to use over the years. And, and then also, as I mentioned at the start of the talk, um, along with my collaborators, uh, we've just recently written a book called Coloring the Universe. And Coloring the Universe is about a lot of the topics that I've talked about today. Uh, it's a book that's not only full of pretty pictures. We have over 300 astronomical images in the book. But what we do in the book is talk about how we make the images and uh, what these images mean. And so the last thing I wanted to share with you is we just made a book trailer for it. Do you, do you know what a book trailer is? I just learned what this is. A book trailer is a trailer, a movie, like a movie trailer, but it's for a book. <laughs> so, uh, so this is the trailer we just uh, made for the book. Let's see if you can hear this. Have you ever looked at an image of space, say like a galaxy or nebula, and wondered, is this real? Is this what it really looks like? Or maybe you even ask yourself, if I were standing right next to this object, is this what I would see? Hi, I'm Travis Rector, and I'm a professional astronomer. For the last 20 years, I've been coming here to Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona to make beautiful images of space using the giant telescopes here. Along with my collaborators, Kim Arcan and Megan Watsky of the Chandra X-ray Observatory, we have written a book called Coloring the Universe, which gives you a behind-the-scenes look at how these beautiful images of space are made with the professional telescopes. We're now inside the dome of the Mayall 4-meter telescope. This is the largest telescope on Kitt Peak and is one of my favorite to use. In our book, we have over 300 color images of space, many of which were taken with this telescope. With this, we can see objects that are over 100 million times fainter than what the human eye can see. We're now inside the control room of the 4-meter telescope. This is where the astronomers sit when they're observing at night. When we're observing, we observe from dusk to dawn because telescope time is precious. For every five astronomers who ask for time, only one will get it. So this computer here is what's used to control the camera that takes the pictures. Behind me is where the telescope operator sits. The telescope operator is the celestial taxi driver. He or she is the one who points the telescope at the object that we're looking at. Professional telescopes like these give us superhuman vision. They literally allow us to make the invisible visible. In Coloring the Universe, we explain how we use these giant telescopes to make color images of space. We hope you enjoy this behind-the-scenes look at how professional astronomers see the universe. So uh, that is my talk, and um, as I mentioned before, uh, we do have books for sale. The book uh, is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble's uh, website as well. Um, the book normally sells for $50, but we're selling it here for $40. Uh, what should you do with that extra $10? Maybe donate it to the to lecture series here. Uh, so if you're interested in getting a copy of the book, um, we do have them for sale uh, behind at, at the exit up, up above. And uh, after the Q&A session, I'd be happy to assign copies of the book as well if you're interested. So thank you all for coming. I hope you've enjoyed the talk.